Welcome to the 2013 commencement ceremonies of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. My name is Ian McLean, and I'm the Vice Chair for Astronomy. It is my honor to be your host today. And yes, that is a Scottish accent you can hear. <laughs> my job today is to keep us uh, on time, moving at warp speed, you might say. Actually, I'm standing in for Professor James Rosenzweig, uh, Chair of the Department, because today, Jamie is a parent. And like you, he's actually sitting in the back of an auditorium at the University of California at Santa Cruz, where his daughter is graduating today. And talking about students, let's bring in the graduates. This time I'd like to invite Erica Escobar to the stadium. And if everyone would please stand, Erica will lead us in the national anthem. stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we washed were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red clear the bombs bursting in here gave proof through the that our flag was still there. Oh, say the sad star spangled banner yet wave. Or the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you, thank you, Erica. Thank you, Erica, that was wonderful. So I think everyone is seated. Let's begin with the main part of the program. So we begin with the presentation of the Rudnick Abelman Scholarship and the Winstein Award. It's my pleasure to invite to the, po the podium Professor Joe Rudnick, Dean of Physical Science and a distinguished physicist himself, to present the Rudnick Abelman Scholarship and the Winstein Award. Joe? Thank you, Ian. Um, for almost, for, for the ceremony is really to uh, celebrate the people who are in transition, most of whom will be leaving us. Uh, this award honors people, students, who will be with us a little bit longer. The uh, Rudnick Abelman Scholarships honor the memory and the accomplishments of my father, Isidore Rudnick, a distinguished, much honored, and deeply treasured member of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. He received his PhD from UCLA, and he served as a faculty member in the department from 1948 until his retirement in 1987. The award also recognizes the important contributions to this department and to this institution of Ronald Abelman, a highly successful alumnus and a greatly valued friend. 
With these scholarships, we register our pride in students, undergraduate and graduate, who, through their accomplishments, have brought distinction to UCLA. This year, there are three undergraduate recipients and one graduate scholar. The uh, undergraduate scholarships go to Gavin Carlson. Will you join me on stage? Uh, Li Chia Tai, please come up. Uh, a third goes to Pak Kwan Chin, who is unable to attend. And the one graduate scholarship goes to Jeffrey Schwartz. Now, what I presented them with is our very nice certificate suitable for framing. Uh, what they will also receive are three or four substantial checks. Uh, and uh, I'd just like you to join me in acknowledging uh, these remarkable students. Next in the program are the addresses by the students. Sorry. Uh, David, I didn't know you were going to present the Winstein Award. So, so David Salzberg, uh, Vice Chair, will present the Winstein Award. So uh, one of the wonderful things about coming and doing an undergraduate work at a university like UCLA is the ability to do cutting edge research while you're still an undergraduate. About 50 years ago, Bruce Winstein was sitting where you are, probably not in this building, and graduated in, uh, with a physics degree, and is one of our most was one of our most uh, illustrious uh, uh, alums. He went on to become recognized as probably one of the best uh, experimental particle physicists of his generation. And through a generous gift from uh, him and his wife Joan, we've established the Winstein Award to recognize excellence in independent work done in the fields of nuclear and particle physics by an undergraduate. And this year's awardee, uh, Dante Raphael Gordon, uh, did uh, exceptional work building detectors to search for the dark matter, the invisible matter that permeates the galaxy and perhaps the universe of which we know almost nothing about. He worked with uh, Professor Arasaka and uh, we wish to recognize his work here with, again, a beautiful certificate and a very nice check. So, Dante. Okay, thank you, David. So now we move on to the student address. So I'd like to invite John Abraham to make the student address on behalf of the graduate students. Thank you all for coming here um, and joining with us in celebrating our accomplishment. Um, thank you for this opportunity to address our family and friends who have gathered with us to commemorate this. Having completed this step in our lives, we can now look back to what has happened and to give an account. We can also look forward to see what will come of this accomplishment. Though I haven't lived a very long time, and really who thinks they have, I have lived long enough to see that things get more interesting with time, the layers build, ironies emerge, and the story gets more involved, richer. Having had the good fortune to spend some time abroad in Europe while young, I can say the history of the places in Europe really stand in contrast to the US, um, especially here on the West Coast. Um, <clears throat> sure, there are a few historical sites, but nothing when you compare with, say, Rome. Um, when I'm in a moment of reflection, I tend to think back through my life and through the ages of history, but I'm sure you really didn't expect to hear the words, these words at this event and with this group. But that's the risk you take, Jenny, when you ask a liberal arts major uh, to give a talk. Perspective is something that is a challenge to achieve. Um, it's having the right scale in mind, the right context for the matter at hand, and that's something that's really a challenge uh, in physics and in, in history. And history is something that can provide that scale for human events. What we're commemorating today is a human event, 
And I think the best way of appreciating human events is through looking at history. Um, and one of my favorite stories is the, the story of a, a villa uh, outside Castel Gandolfo. It's about 30 miles outside of Rome. Um, when I was thinking about what to do with myself after finishing the liberal arts degree, I happened to find myself in Rome, and I mentioned to a friend that I was thinking of studying physics. I thought it would be a good way to spend the remainder of my 20s. Uh, little did I know that that decision would start an endeavor that continued well into my 30s. Uh, that's the risk I took. As well, um, I was attracted to the idea of pursuing a field uh, that was something less slippery than philosophy, something more tangible. I wanted to go out and measure things. Um, well, my friend happened to know a physicist at the Vatican Observatory, which happened to be at Castel Gandolfo, just outside of Rome. I went there to meet him and see the observatory, and he told me the history of it. Uh, so Castel Gandolfo, it's an ancient city that was started before Roman, the Roman Empire and the Republic. And uh, during the empire, uh, noble families started spending their summers there and building villas. It's much nicer than a, a big city like Rome in the summer. And uh, one of those families happened to be uh, headed by Hadrian, who was an emperor who persecuted the church. <clears throat> and then you fast forward about 1,500 years later, that's one of the interesting things you can do with history, and a new noble decides to make that his home. And that happened to be Pope Urban VIII, um, who also happened to be the pope who silenced Galileo. And now it's the Vatican Observatory. So places with history can be very fascinating. And then having a life with history can be fascinating too. Um, and so we can take a moment and think about what we've accomplished and what we have yet to accomplish. And what we have accomplished, well, we've contributed to the body of knowledge of the physical world. And although our contributions may be small incremental steps, um, any contribution to something of that kind is, is, is valuable in itself. As I'm sure we've all come to learn along those close to us, it's, it's a contribution that took much sacrifice. Um, while in graduate school, you eventually come to realize how much sacrifice that is. And it can be challenging at times to continue, but it's well worth it in the end. And when I think about what we've really gained from our time in graduate school, it's not just that small contribution, but it's also the habits of person and mind um, which we've developed in our time here, the perseverance to see a question to a resolution, the commitment to truth, um, regardless of what the outcome may show us. And our time here will be have been well spent if we use that gift of those, those habits, not just to advance knowledge, but also to help others, which I'm sure is something we all hope to do, um, leaving graduate school. And as I'm you know, sure we all know, it's not quite an easy time here, but the challenge is to take our experiences and to help the cause of our neighbor uh, with that same determination to persevere that helped us complete our degrees. Um, and so with this gift that's been bestowed on us by circumstance, by the support of our families, the mentoring of the faculty, um, it's our chance now to improve lives of others. And I think that's, in the end, the real message of history, what we do for others. Um, and also, I think, what the Romans learned, and we may learn as well one day, that empire is really not worth the bother. Um, <laughs> it's much better to, be some, to let someone else be in charge, uh, as I've learned with Gary. <laughs> but that, in the end, you know, you can enjoy things, um, and to enjoy those things while you can. And it's funny to look back on, think of the things that you once thought of as unbearable, but you survived, um, much like sometimes we look at graduate school. Sorry, thank you for this opportunity to speak. <laughs> Hope that wasn't too dark. <laughs> so. Thank you, John. That wasn't too dark. And <laughs> And in fact, you rocketed me back uh, to the 1970s by mentioning Castel Gandolfo, because I was a young postdoc for one of the scientists there back in the 70s. Okay, let's keep moving on. Now I'd like to invite Nora Brackbill and Karina Cheng to, make, to come together to the stage and make the address on behalf of the graduating class of 2013. <laughs>
Thank you very much for that. Um, we have had the near impossible task of capturing the past few years in just a few minutes. We are a class of 80 physicists, 55 physics, 15 astro, and 10 bio, and we all share a love for the fascinating, fundamental, often frustrating <laughs> subject of physics. In fact, we share much more than that. I think the one thing that really stood out to us as we brainstormed for this speech is how grateful we are to be a part of the UCLA physics and astronomy family. We especially wanted to highlight the importance of the friendships we've made here by giving this speech together as friends. Even though we are going to rival schools. <laughs> During our time here at UCLA, we have done some truly great things. We have examined the intricacies of motion with Newton. Investigated magnetism and electricity with Maxwell. <laughs> Observed light years away with Galileo. Explored the structure of DNA with biophysicists such as Crick. <laughs> and experienced gravity with Einstein. But all of this would not have been possible. <laughs> but all of this would not have been possible without the incredible support from this department and the people in it. Now, some people tend to characterize physicists as weird and quirky, and we can honestly say that this is true. Just look at us. <laughs> Nora and I took this time to reflect back at some of our first impressions at the people in this department. And one of the memories that stands out to me is from my first introduction to astrophysics course, taught by a professor who would later become my advisor. On the first day of class, she had us all give our name and an interesting fact about ourselves. And these are a couple that stood out. See if you guys can guess who said these. <laughs> my name is X, and I'm a speed cuber. <laughs> my name is Y and I electrocuted myself today. <laughs> My name is Z, and I like to party. Yeah. <laughs> so these are some of the people that I had the privilege of working with in many of my classes. My first meeting was, uh, my first memory was a meeting with the physics counselor at orientation. Patrick, who was the third year at the time, was walking by, and the counselor asked him to share his thoughts about the department, to which he responded, eh, it's okay. He had been taking 18L at the time and was suffering through one of the lab write-ups. Fortunately, it didn't discourage me from physics, and clearly it didn't stop him either, because he's still around the department to this day. So, as you can see, there are a range of students here, but not only that, uh, we have encountered an interesting mix of professors as well, from the ones who gave us 15-page equation sheets for our exams, to the ones who started class by debating the value of those other majors. To the, ones, <laughs> to the ones who are stuck in their CGS unit ways. And the ones who like to debate the finer points of American pronunciation. And then there are our grad student TAs who dealt with our many silly questions. And our counselors who also dealt with our silly questions. In all seriousness though, our professors have guided us, trained us, and helped us develop the skills to succeed. We have learned to view the world through a physicist's eye. We have learned to seek out the explanations and answers to our questions, including the hardest problems of all, the ones without solution manuals. Despite the demanding problem sets and exams, our professors do want us to succeed, both in and out of the classroom. They have encouraged us to explore cutting edge research, given us the confidence to tackle difficult problems, and helped us reach our full potential. We've gained the critical thinking and problem solving skills we need for the next stage of our careers, where no one knows the answers to the problems we are trying to solve. So thank you so much for preparing us for our future. Amongst the students here, we have formed a tight community. We support each other through the ups and downs of undergraduate life, and we have formed friendships with people who will someday be our colleagues. Or rivals. But let me tell you, there is no better way to bond than by working through an impossible homework set together. The department as a whole has encouraged the development of these friendships by providing resources and opportunities to collaborate and bond. The undergraduate computer lab, informally known as the C-Lab, served as our social hub for late night gaming, Facebooking, and on occasion, studying. 
The Society of Physics students and the Undergraduate Astronomical Society promoted collaboration via camping trips, movie nights, and physics puzzles. The end of the year physics prom was also a chance for bonding along with some awkward dancing. This year's theme was a night of entanglement. And for those of you who don't consider yourself a physicist, that's a quantum mechanics reference. But don't worry, because we barely understand that reference ourselves. <laughs> this department has truly provided a supportive learning environment for us to develop and grow into independent thinkers. We are so fortunate to be here at UCLA, and we cannot forget everyone who has helped us get here, including all the supportive families who are here today. Hi, Mom. Grads, can we all join in thanking our families? Class of 2013, don't forget that we are Bruins for life, and this means carrying with us the Bruin commitment to research, education, and service wherever we go. As Albert Einstein said, strive not to be a success, but rather to be of value. We are ready to give something of value back to this world, whether it's by pushing the boundaries of scientific knowledge through research or adapting our skill set to other challenges. We owe it to the people who helped us get here to go out and do great things, because we can, because we're ready, because we're equipped with bright and curious minds, and because we want to. As Brian Williams said, you don't actually have to go to space or build a rocket ship, but please take us somewhere. Please keep us moving. Push us, build us up, make us better. And so no matter what vector we're on, towards a real life job, traveling, or grad school, the opportunities don't end here. Carl Sagan says it the best. Somewhere, something incredible is waiting to be known. Congratulations, Congratulations class, class of 2013. 2013. Thank you, Nora and Karina. That was wonderful. It is now my distinct privilege and pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Raymond Orbach. As you can see from the program, Ray obtained his first and second degrees in physics at Caltech and Berkeley. But what the program does not say is that Ray was a member of this department for many years, beginning in the early 60s. And then, in fact, he was, from 1982 to 1992, the provost of the College of Letters and Science, before leaving to spend a decade as chancellor of UC Riverside. In fact, the reference that I made to my Scottish accent earlier was to enable me to say a thank you to Ray, because Ray was instrumental along with others, including Joe Rudnick, the dean, who was actually chair of the physics department back in 1989. And both of these people were responsible for initiating a new program that brought me here to UCLA in 1989. From 2002 to 2009, Ray was director of the Office of Science uh, at the Department of Energy, and in fact, their first undersecretary of science. He also founded the Energy Institute at the University of Texas at Austin, and many other things. <laughs> Ray has had an extremely distinguished career, and we're delighted to welcome him back to UCLA. Ray. Thank you, Ian, and thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to return to this wonderful institution, and also to congratulate the graduates, both undergraduate and at the graduate level, for their accomplishments. To quote your chair, these are wonderful fields that you have worked in. These fields are the science that ignites our deepest curiosity, and that excitement is why all of us have decided to make physics and or astronomy our career. It's also very exciting to see how many awards and prizes the faculty of this department has received and the fact that you as undergraduates and graduate students participated in those discoveries. My wife Eva and I are delighted to be back to UCLA. I have to say it's changed almost beyond recognition <laughs> though some old landmarks still can be found. 
UCLA was our home for 30 years. Two of our children are UCLA grads. Our children were raised while I was developing my physics and administrative career here. Even while I was provost of the College of Letters and Science in the 80s, before many of you were born, I taught Physics 40A, the first course in introductory physics for science majors. To give you an idea of how long ago that was, I'm now at the University of Texas at Austin and will be teaching freshman physics this fall. The chair of the department there was curious about my teaching ability, so he questioned senior, senior faculty in the department about my teaching. Some of them had taken my course as freshmen at UCLA. <laughs> so the chair, fortunately they gave me a good recommendation, so the chair allowed me to teach that course, and what goes around comes around. The departments of physics and astronomy were separate in my days for reasons I never really understood. And it's wonderful to see them merged. There's really no difference between them. There are other fields that I helped create here at UCLA of which I'm very proud. When David Klein and I had the nerve to go to DOE leadership in Washington and announce that we intended to create a program in particle beam physics, I was unaware of how audacious that was. The DOE hierarchy is supposed to approve these things in advance, but we announced that it was a done deal. Of course, the rest is history, including recognition that particle beams physics is an essential part of physics research. As part of the team that created the Keck telescope, I insisted UCLA have observation time on UC telescopes, and this department has utilized them so well. We may take it for granted now, but we had to break into the club at that time. Now as scientists, you graduates can contribute to society as no other profession. You have the background of rigor, of mathematical precision, and yes, dealing with frustration, as you just heard, at what seems like impossible challenges. You need to continue that tradition. It is very special. But it can be humbling. To quote from a Wall Street Journal review of brilliant blunders, science is far from a continuous path towards the truth. Instead, we move forward in fits and starts with long detours and dead ends but always revising what we know, always viewing it as provisional and potentially wrong. But this is a point of pride among scientists, the process of science, testing and revising our picture of nature is the only part that does not change. So many times we scientists thought we understood nature, only to find out that not only were we wrong, but that nature was even more exciting than what everybody knows. Our history is littered with examples. I don't know how many of you still use Heitler's book, The Quantum Theory of Radiation, but the opening of the first chapter is a quote from the end of the 19th century. It is, the theory of radiation is working itself out splendidly. <laughs> that was well before quantum mechanics stood the world on its head. Einstein's famous remark, God does not play dice with the universe, meant that the uncertainty principle was alien to his world. And Hoyle's rejection of the Big Bang was centered on his equivalent discomfort that our universe began at a singular point in time. His continuous creation theory was very intellectually satisfying, but wrong. The latest example is the expansion of our universe. Everybody knew that it would either slow down, or even more, that it would reverse and become the big crunch. Well, observation shows that not only is it not slowing down, it's accelerating outward because of what we now call dark energy. Not only is that concept accepted now, but it amounts to two-thirds of the energy of the universe. Yet its existence was unknown and unexpected only 20 years ago. Who knows what else we have gotten wrong? Feynman stated that no one understands quantum mechanics. 
Again from the book review, a professor went into his class on Thursday and said, remember what I told you on Tuesday? It's wrong. <laughs> and if that worries you, you need to get out of science. <laughs> now many of you are going on to graduate school, postdoctoral positions, industry, and perhaps government. And I encourage you to keep your science alive. Keep abreast of its wondrous discoveries and achievements. While I was provost, chancellor of the University of California, Riverside, and undersecretary for science at the Department of Energy, I kept my physics research alive. It kept me sane during moments of administrative stress. It kept me grounded and put life in perspective. But more importantly, it continued to enrich my life. Now that I'm going back to teaching and research, it continues. And it will for you too. Your careers may take you into entirely unknown and surprising directions. But there is one force that will continue to keep you focused and will give you the intellectual strength so necessary for success, the rigor and excitement of discovery. For those of you flirting with a career in policy, it's important to keep your science alive and achieve results and recognition before entering policy fields. I joined the Department of Energy in the midst of a personally exciting career in physics, and I never left science during my seven-year tenure as the Director of the Office of Science and Under Secretary for Science, both U.S. Senate confirmed positions. My graduate student would come to Washington, D.C., and we would meet after working hours at the UCDC complex and go over his experiments and their implications. And this continued through my government tenure. It kept me intellectually alert. DOE was a great place to work and with wonderfully dedicated people. The research that I oversaw is some of the most exciting in the world, comprising high energy physics, nuclear physics, high end computation, fusion science, condensed matter physics, and biology and environmental research. I dealt on a daily basis with the Office of Management and Budget and members of Congress. At all times, no one could blindside me with comments about science. I knew what was happening, and I could act in what I thought was science's best interest. And one person can make a difference. The measure of independence was crucial to my performance. President Bush supported me down the line and were some of the results that you are aware of. ITER, the fastest high-end computing machines in the world, open to all. The support of the American presence at CERN, FRIB for nuclear physics, the Energy Frontier Research Centers nationwide at universities and national laboratories, and the Biological Research Centers leading the way for fuel from plants. The oversight of 10 national laboratories and major roles in international science relationships were also part of the job. Through them all, a strong background in physics gave me independence and foresight. If you wish to enter policy areas, keep this essential condition in mind. Enough for now. Again, I want to congratulate all of you on your accomplishments. You have achieved a major milestone in your career. Godspeed. <laughs>